everyone, my name is Dorothy, and I'm super excited to welcome you to this fall's pitch event. So give a round of applause for all the pitches today. Really exciting. You know, I would say that the pitch is the biggest event of the year at Dartmouth, but that would be false because there are actually two pitches. So it's this fall and also this winter. So get ready for that. Um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We're here today for the 19F pitch which is hosted by the Dolly Lab and the Magnuson Center. And today we have two representatives from the Dolly Lab and Magnuson Center. They are our four judges. So first we have Laya and Wiley. Wave hi. Hi. <laughs> and we have Chloe and Jay from the Magnuson Center. Hi. So what is the pitch? Well, we have 12 amazing pitches that uh, are comprised of little teams from one to like a million people. Uh, and they'll just give a quick two, min two minute presentation on their great idea. And I just introduced them, but four thoughtful judges. Three prizes. So if you wanna look here, crane your necks a little bit, we have three great prizes. First is best pitch, which is voted on by the audience. And I'll explain how to vote um, in a second but that is given to the overall best pitch as decided by you. Next is the startup prize, which is a $1,000 grant given by the Magnuson Center. Um, so that would allow that prize winner to further their pitch idea. And then the last is the startup prize, which is uh, the build prize by the Dolly Lab, in which you would get an equivalent of a $10,000 build prize and um, Dolly will basically develop that idea for you in like a web app, a computer thing, um, and we even do engineering now, so a lot of different options. And of course, one very attentive audience, and that is you. So I'm gonna explain the plan, and I'm sure that you will pay attention to this because it's very important. Um, so first, this is right now from seven to eight, we have our pitches, they're two minutes each with three minutes of questions. Um, we will start applauding at the end of two minutes so the pitches don't go over. Um, you'll be able to submit your questions to a link I'm about to show you, but also the judges will have their own questions ready. Next, at 8 p.m., we will have pizza outside and you'll be able to mingle and talk about how great those ideas were as judges decide who wins what and also as we tally up the ballots. So if you don't have one of these little small little uh, square guys, let us know because that's how you're gonna vote. And then at 8.30 about, the winners will be announced. It might be earlier, um, so just like hang around here. Uh, it's gonna be a huge ordeal, so don't leave. Okay, so judging criteria, what should you be looking at? Well, first, is it new and is it cool? You don't want something that has been done over and over again, um, and you don't want something that doesn't have that wow factor. So the good news for you is that we have already vetted all of these ideas. Um, they apply and we took the cream of the crop. So they are already new and cool, but you wanna think about what's the newest and what's the coolest. So next is impact. So what kind of impact does it have? Who does it help? And to what extent would this idea help those people? Um, so that's for you to decide and up to the pitchy to convince you how big their impact will be. Third, feasibility, so this is really important. They could have the best idea ever, but they might not know how to get there, or um, the technology is not up to date, or maybe their scope is just too big, so think about feasibility. And lastly, the quality of the pitch, so the presentation themselves. Are they really excited about their idea and um, getting you excited about the idea, or does their pitch not really make you feel excited about their pitch, if that makes any sense. So think about new and cool, impact, feasibility, and quality of pitch. And I just went through the prizes, but your pick is the best pitch. There's also the startup prize and the build prize. Cool, and this is a ballot that you're gonna get, and I'm gonna show you how not to vote. So only vote for one team. In the past, we've had like multiple voting, yada yada, but just erase all that from your memory, vote for one. So this is not what you wanna do. Um, don't vote for multiples, because we'll have to not tech count your ballot. Um, don't vote in a way that looks like you're voting for multiple. Um, just make it really clear what you're voting for. 
Okay, so now I'm going to tell you to take out your phones, iPads, um, computers, or any sort of electronic device if you want to submit questions. So the judges are going to come up with their own questions, but also they are going to be able to pull from your questions. Um, and this is a, an update from how we may have done it in the past. This is just so that we can streamline everything and not have like people running around um, getting people to raise their hands. So please put this in your phones. Um, I will okay, write it up. I'm sorry, new link. Sorry, that one's not working. I can read it out to you guys though. Okay, sweet. Yes, read it out. Um, new link is slides. Are you writing down? Okay, slides.app dot g o o dot g l slash g uppercase z q z and then lowercase g okay it's also written in chalkboard here don't know if you could see but yeah just kind of crane your heads around for that okay are we good with Questions submitted. <coughs> yeah, sure. Do you mind writing it? Yeah. Perfect. All right. While she's doing that, I'm just going to continue. Um, so yeah, let's let's pitch. Um, so we're going to have a little pause as I pull up their slides. But the first pitchy is going to be "Show Me the Path." So everyone, round of applause, please. Thank you. So, hi guys, I'm the new, and I'm with showmethepath.org. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that kid in the blue jacket. He's a family friend, and back when I was in the fifth grade, he got into Princeton. Watching him get into Princeton did two really important things for me. One, it showed me that it was possible for a middle class kid going to LA public schools to get into a school like Princeton. And two, he showed me the path, the basics of what I had to do to get into a school like Princeton. And when I was applying for college, he was there to you know, give me advice, answer my texts, and go over my essays. Unfortunately, a lot of students aren't so lucky. According to a paper titled The Missing One Ops from the Brookings Institution, Every year, 25 to 35,000 high-achieving, low-income students graduate high school per year, the vast majority of whom don't apply to a single selected school, in large part because they don't know anybody who's ever been to one. And when you don't know anybody who's ever been to an elite institution, it's really easy to imagine that the only kids who get in are kids who've either bribed a rowing coach or cured cancer, when that's just not the case. Our plan is to use Dolly Resources to build a website that one, collects and shares paths similar students have taken, so what they did in high school, what they did with their summers and so on, and two, connects high school students with similar college students, so they have somebody to text when they have questions, somebody to go over their essays. Now, in the status quo, there are programs to help these high school students out, but in the case of in-person programs, they tend to search under lampposts. They exist in large cities or university neighborhoods, where the vast majority of these high-achieving, low-income students just don't live. And two, they're expensive and difficult to scale, especially in the case of fly-in programs, where they literally fly kids into schools. On the other hand, you have online forums like collegeconfidential.com that are entirely unvetted and aren't specific to target demographics. With your help, we believe that we can build a platform to show thousands of high-achieving, low-income high school students the path to an Ivy League education. Thank you. Thank you so much. So judges, what are your comments? Hi. Um, awesome pitch. Um, Thank you. So how exactly do you plan on <coughs> marketing and scaling a past just described what's already out there? How do you plan on spreading this product more or less? Yeah, so we have basically two target constituencies we really need. So the first one is college students whose stories or paths we need to collect. And I think the easiest way to go about that is to literally just reach out to our friends at other schools, and especially for the freshman Facebook pages, which are huge. 
If you just toss out a Google form, which we already have, asking for the basics, a lot of people are really willing to provide it. And in my experience, having seen a ton of friends do this, a lot of college students are already willing to like put their phone number out for people from their social networks to ask them questions. And we're just asking, hey, would you be willing to share a little bit farther? Now, in the case of high school students, that's where we feel we especially need something like Dolly Lab in that our primary constituency to reach these high school students is actually going to be school administrators and basically school districts. And the easiest way for us to reach them is that one, we have a faculty advisor named Professor Bruce Sasserdote who already does a lot of work in uh, college education and getting kids into higher ed. And we feel that if we can put, yeah, we're sponsored by Dolly Lab at Dartmouth, it's really easy for me to start sending out emails to high school administrators and saying, hey, look, do you have any students who you feel show a ton of promise and might benefit from some program like this? So uh, there's a question from the audience here. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of revenue model are you thinking of putting in place? So if you're hoping to be a billionaire, I'm, I'm not the guy for you. I'm really sorry. Um, but as far as revenue goes, again, we're hoping that with the Dolly program, we're hoping to be as low budget as possible, but when it comes to revenue, we think once we have a scaled up model, we'll likely be able to get decent amounts of cash from the admissions departments at these lead institutions. And also, there's a ton of nonprofits out there that especially once you have that level of legitimacy of being like out there and supported by a school like Dartmouth, we think that definitely the Jack Kent Cook Foundation or the Obama Foundation or any number of foundations would be willing to lend us the hopefully small amounts of money we need. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Showmepath.org. Um, next up, we have Phi Dega. Woo! So, together. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam, and this is Phi Dega. So, tech innovation is super awesome because it's always changing things. In fact, technology has the ability to revolutionize entire industries especially the freelance industry. In today's day and age, there are millions of freelancers out there creating brand new products and services for us to consume. Anything from video editing to education, and yes, even video game and Fortnite tutoring. In fact, this entire audience has technical skills that they can monetize on websites like Fiverr and Guru, but very few of us actually do. Why? It's because websites like Fiverr and Guru make it a very difficult process and extremely time consuming. I'm talking about bid proposals, negotiating prices, lengthy communication, milestone systems, and all this bureaucracy that makes it extremely difficult to actually provide a service or get one for yourself. That's where Fidega steps in. Fidega is a frictionless, on-demand digital service platform for micro tasks and micro projects that is as simple as putting in your project, putting in your proposal, and your price, and getting connected with someone in under five minutes. We're designed for small projects and services, not apps that will take weeks, months, and are thousands of dollars. I'm talking about things less than 24 hours and less than $100. Because on these, on these platforms like Fiverr, Upwork, and Guru, there's so much friction that these tasks cannot be transacted in an efficient manner. So as a buyer, you have access to thousands of creators that can help with what you need done, and you can get connected with them in as little as five to 10 minutes and actually get whatever you need completed. And on the seller side, we give you extreme flexibility. You go on the website when you want. It's as simple as clicking a project or a job that you want to engage in, and it's as simple as getting it done right then. No need for lengthy communication, browsing through websites, applying to jobs that you're never going to get. It's just connecting and getting it done in pay. We're disrupting a market that is having extremely strong demand headwinds, and that's because the structures of websites like Fiverr and Upwork, these freelance sites, are so rigid and are not able to adapt to these micro tasks and micro services that people need to execute in real time, not over a period of weeks and months, and not in the thousands of dollars. And this doesn't include unrealized applications like tutoring and consultation in every single industry out there. This is our team. And as Fidega, we're asking through the Magnuson grant to use that money in order to market and scale. Yeah, thank you so much. Judges, what do you think about Fidega? Yeah, it sounds like a really cool idea. Thank, thank you, you for presenting today. Um, 
One question I had was, how are you going to build trust and accountability through this service? Um, am I using verification? Or? Yeah, so that's a super good question. The problem is that there's so low volume of freelancers on websites like Fiverr or Guru that you have people who aren't that qualified trying to engage in products to make money. So when we make the model of our website very frictionless and we're capitalizing on people who have skills but aren't monetizing them, and we bring a lot of people on, it means that the skill gap between the person who's purchasing it and the people that are actually delivering that product gets much wider, which means that you're getting a better product and there's no need for additional vetting. Okay, got it. Um, one of, a few of the audience questions are actually along these lines. In for terms sure. of illegal activities, would you be worried about that? Yeah, so just like on any e-commerce or you know freelancer website, we have um, certain ways with um, you know filters in the engine to make sure that that's filtered out. We have manual review that really shouldn't be a concern because we are able to monitor that and eliminate that before it starts. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Big round of applause. Next we have Vibrate. So clap for Vibrate. Good evening, everyone. My name is Batman. I'm just checking if I have attention to my audience. My name is Dan. I'm uh, representing Vibrate. Uh, what is Vibrate? So Vibrate is a solution to a problem. So what's, uh, what is the problem? So the problem is that uh, people judge, uh, judge their picture by, uh, based on personal uh, biases. And they will be either lucky or wrong. So the solution uh, is for that is Vibrate. It's a network, network of people uh, giving feedback to each other, and they where uh, and where uh, they can select the demographic uh, which um, gives feedback to their pictures. Um, so uh, Vibrate tries to uh, uh, answer to such questions as in which picture do I look most attractive for the opposite sex, or for example, in which picture do I look most professional. This thing should be uh, useful for LinkedIn, for example. Um, so, I, I like this picture a lot, so what I want to say by that is that Vibrate will show only this, this shiny like, <laughs> part, only the best part of your face. Why? Because um, it will rank it by uh, the people which you are target, uh, you are targeting uh, will rank it, so you, you'll see the best picture from only their face. You'll see this big number, this means the market is very big, 33 million users in the United States use online data <laughs> services at least they were using in 2018. And this is also a big number, at least it's expected to be so in 2025, uh, the profits, yearly profits. Uh, so our business model, how we will get money? So we will uh, sell credits to users which want to um, get feedback for, let's say, a lot of pictures and on, let's say, on a daily basis or regularly. And they need the credits because uh, uh, they, because they exchange credits for feedback. Or can, uh, competitors, I'm very happy to say that they are terrible and we are better than them. Uh, but the best one is photo filler. Um, so uh, none of our competitors support targeted feedback. And this means everyone will rank your pictures, male, females, different demographics from uh, India, Japan, I don't know which country. So, um, and it's not enough, which is good news for us. Now, Upright and Spontana are extremely terrific apps. Uh, Spontana doesn't work at all, and Upright has a uh, terrific user experience, which uh, we are trying to solve. So, as you can see, we, uh, there are people trying to solve this solution, but they are doing so terribly. So, that's where Vibrate comes in, and um, yeah, we have a niche, we have a market, and we have a room to grow. Thank you. Judges, questions for Vibrate? Uh, yeah, that was a very interesting pitch, um, certainly very thought compelling. Um, one of my questions for you is how you're going to um, train the intelligence without um, perpetuating biases, especially if you're having it be supported by users' feedback. So, so, you are, uh, so the, your question is how I am trying to stop like, um, Incorrect feedback. So people randomly giving feedback. I uh, what? Um, what can you rephrase your question? Yeah. So like, if humans are providing the yes. feedback for the pictures and mm -hmm. rating them on qualities, and humans have oh like, yeah. 
yeah. judgments that yeah. may or may not be so we, How do you avoid Yeah, that? so we will have an uh, um, artificial intelligence algorithm which where uh, that will detect if the person is randomly giving uh, random data. And, and uh, if we detect that the user does that, then he will be eliminated from the system for a short period of time. And if it uh, happens so continuously, he is banned for forever. Okay. Yeah. So let me see if there are some user, or not user, audience questions. Um, how will, how do you think that this will impact users um, as far as handling disappointment or like how do you make, plan to make this an uplifting? So um, um, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so th that's uh, what Vibrate tries to so uh, to to uh, to give is uh, credible data, and credible data means uh, credible data. That's what it means. It is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. That was Vibrate, and the next presentation is going to um, increase your brain cells by a few percentage points because it's about. Quantum computing. So next up is QBrain. Hi, my name is Kanal, and I'll be pitching uh, for QBrain today, a tool that I developed as part of my PhD studies. I work with Professor Redfield in physics department at Dartmouth, and we're one of the leading groups in the world for quantum computation. So, what is quantum computation? It is a paradigm changing new technology that harnesses the power of quantum, com quantum mechanics. Quantum computers are expected to perform in a matter of hours exact simulation of drug molecules that could take today's computers more than, the, more than thousands of years. They could also break encryption that powers Bitcoin and most of the credit card transactions. So what is the most important problem that has been limiting the progress of the field of quantum computing? One is complicated. To quote an article from New York Times, by some accounts, fewer than a thousand people in the world could be claim could claim that they are doing leading research in the field. If you look at the landscape of the quantum computing world today, all the major tech companies are building their own hardware as well as software. Getting everything to work on your own computer could be very cumbersome and leads to a bad experience. Our mission, unlock the potential of quantum computing for the next generation of programmers. We plan to do this in two ways, Qubrate OS and Qubrate Cloud. OS will be the first unified one-stop platform for developing quantum algorithms. Just imagine a user, a user logging in and without any installation running quantum computing code on quantum computers right away. But, in our eyes, <coughs> unlocking the potential of quantum computers also means educating the next generation of programmers to think quantum. So, we will, as part of the Qubrate Cloud, we will develop courses which are friendly and hands-on, aimed at high school and university students. Thank you so much, and judges? Great, yeah. Um, sorry your page got cut short. Um, I have no longer version of it, so hopefully I'm prepared to ask some questions, although I'm not an expert in quantum computing <laughs> whatsoever. Um, I guess, so one of the examples that you had given um, in your pitch application uh, was an example of like a, comp a competing service, which is like a little quantum, I guess. And they offered similar cloud-based services for this quantum computing and like a lot of people develop algorithms. So I guess specifically, what sets you apart from that competitor? Uh, so right now, they haven't made public what they're doing. They just claim that uh, they'll be developing something. I think that the only thing that I read in the uh, news was they claim democratizing uh, quantum. But they didn't say what exactly they'll be developing. So they haven't set up that they'll be developing a cloud-based service. 
So right here, we have something which is already ready, up and running. So you could literally log in and start running computations right away. The only thing we're lacking is developing the learning platform further, which would teach the next generation how to run uh, quantum computing. All right. Yeah. <coughs> And we also have a couple of libraries which let you convert from one quantum computer code to other. For example, <coughs> going from IBM's quantum computer to Google's quantum computer. Great. Um, and a question from the audience, and I think this is something you would explain had did more time, um, but why is your team a good fit to tackle this problem? Oh, uh, so as I said, like there are less than 1,000 people in the world, so um, I do quantum chemistry, and I work with Professor Whitfield. We both have NSF grants, so we're recognized in the field. And Andre Colodangelo, who's from Caltech, he was on the most celebrated conference program committee team. So he's also very well known in the um, field. Then we have two undergrads who graduated, one from Stanford and one from MIT. And at this point, I think a big thing in quantum is getting the people. And so we could be, so that's why we're aiming two things. We will also be providing services to industry, and we'll be helping train the next generation of quantum engineers, which is like the most important problem right now for quantum. All right, so the next pitch is going to be a very active one. So put your hands together for Miles. Hi everyone, my name is Archita Karwathi and I'm a 22 at Dartmouth. I'm actually going for a run today and giving a pitch. Let me explain. I'm a new runner. After my brother told me about a running app called Nike Run Club last year, I fell in love with the sport. In fact, this summer I ran over 250 miles. But that took a lot of time. Running takes a lot of time and time is money. So I thought about how about making an app that makes money while you run. I then found New Miles. It's a web and mobile application, a way to dash and get cash for charities and nonprofits. Right now, millions of athletes are logging miles, but they're only benefiting themselves. Community members are also donating millions of dollars, but their donations are passive. Miles is a bridge for this broken connection. Each mile is now a value to a larger community, and each donation is active and engaging. The Miles marketplace consists of milers and sponsors. Milers are our runners. They sign into their favorite running platform, which automatically syncs their miles, which is important, especially for runners who are loyal to their running apps. They then choose a charity to, to run for. Sponsors choose a miler to support and how much they want to um, pay for each time that miler goes on a run. So why miles? Miles improves on existing solutions because it provides community-based health inspiration, creating local running events, and unique donation options such as GoFundMe. I want to see Miles in the world, but for that I need some help. I would love to have Miles developed by the Dolly team, as well as the opportunity to have Miles qualified as a nonprofit. In the end, this will be a marathon, not a sprint, but I will not drop the baton as I believe Miles will change the way we look at exercising and fundraising forever. And I hope that you guys can see that you can run and get some funding at the same time. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, awesome pitch. Um, building on that though, um, how would you scale and what's the incentive for Strava and for Nike and those types of companies to partner with you? Yeah, definitely. So I guess to answer your first question, scalable, like how it's scalable, lots of people run and it's not a very common thing um, to maybe start out in, but most people get um, attached to running with their friends and through running apps and those running apps are also very sociable so the running community is very tight knit. And so the word goes around really quickly. And I think that um, one of the reasons why people run is um, for their personal benefit, but I think more people are motivated when they see that it's another reason why they want to run. So I think I would go for more runs if I knew it was helping other people. And then sorry, can you repeat your second part of your question? Um, what would be their incentives for them to partner with you? Yeah, definitely. So I think um, hopefully there's an incentive to be a good person because I think that everyone should believe in affecting change and personally I think I would 
I think I would be proud of just creating this app even if it helped one person. So I think that, for example, Strava and Nike Run Club would love to participate just for that aspect. But also more people will start using their platforms because, again, we go through their platforms. So not only are we bringing people to Miles, but we're also bringing people to them when they sign up to participate in this. All right, thank you so much. Next up, if you like traveling and you also like saving the environment, then Footprints is the pitch for you. So give it up for Footprints. Hi guys, I'm Morgan. And I'm Annika, and this is Footprints. So we're gonna start with a quick question. Can you please raise your hand if you followed the Amazon rainforest disaster this past summer? Okay, looks like a lot of us. Um, so unfortunately, the destruction of the Amazon every single year is mainly caused by humans. It happens when adjacent land to the forest is cleared, usually for agricultural or commercial value. Um, and this clearly highlights a mismatch between the needs of the environment, but also the needs of the economies of local communities around the world. We're hoping to fix this problem by implementing ecotourism. Ecotourism has actually been applied in a few other places and had really successful results. For example, the Galapagos used to be in a disastrous state due to overfishing. And ecotourism was brought in and all of a sudden the economy switched from relying on this overfishing to relying on the tourists coming in. And this was beneficial for the environment and helped the economy flourish. Should have done that. Okay. So right now, if you're a tourist and you're looking for ecotourism opportunities, you actually don't have many avenues. There are travel websites, but they don't do a super great job at actually filtering out ecotourism itself. And then there are ecotours and volunteer programs, but both of them ask for a pretty significant time investment from anyone who participates. So our solution is a website which will allow the average traveler to find ways to interact with the environment and benefit the environment when they travel. So we're going to provide eco-friendly hotels, tours, and volunteer experiences so people who are traveling will know what they can do to help the environment as they are traveling. So we've actually done a little bit of preliminary market research for this product and the results have been super promising. Um, just as a reminder, the market size of the tourism industry is giant. It's $7.2 trillion. We also found that 61% of tourists are interested in ecotourism. However, only 2% have actually found a way to participate in ecotourism. So this is what we want. We need some more code traveling, design, and data gathering, which as Dolly students, we know Dolly would be super helpful doing this with. Um, and so thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Judges, what do you have for footprints? Great pitch. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could give us maybe some examples of potential partners you might have in mind, or if you've generated any interest from potential host experiences. Yeah, so that's a great question. So we have a few, actually, ideas of people we would partner with. There are a bunch of foundations like ResponsibleTravel.com, um, a bunch of you know places that are trying to stop the Amazon rainforest fires in general that partner with websites. Um, that are trying to make a difference like this. And then on top of that, there's travel websites like greenkey.com, which um, help you help hotels take like get a sustainable standard that they reach. Um, so there are a lot of thing, places that we want guidance from, and then in return, we hope that they can help us become more, like keep our sustainable standard at a gold level. And um, hopefully then having their support would make people rely on us more. One audience member has asked um, how you plan to account for the fact that flying is a big contribution to climate change um, and how you plan to endorse travel while also keeping in mind that aspect. Yeah, that's also an awesome question. Um, so I think we can all agree that while flights do put um, a lot of chemicals in the air and stuff like that, we can't stop people from flying. We can't stop people from traveling right now. We don't have time machines. We don't have like transportation machines. Um, so what we want to do is say, if you are going to be flying, if you are going to be traveling, why don't you take those experiences and actually turn them into something that is also simultaneously giving back to not only the communities, but also the environments and like <laughs> different locations that you're visiting. So in that way, like we're not saying don't travel, we're not saying stop traveling, we're not saying like have all planes land right now, but we're just saying if you're going to do this, like expose yourself to natural wonders and actually like spend some time, spend some like money in terms of trying to give back in that sense. Great, thank you so much for playing So next. You think you 
know yourself, but do you really know yourself? Um, the next pitch is about microbe gut <coughs> biomes. This is Biome, and everyone clap for Biome. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Valls. And my name is Hugh Nguyen, and we are both PhD students in molecular and cellular biology at Dartmouth. And we're here to tell you a little bit about Biome. So everyone in this room has a community of microbes in their gut referred to as the microbiome. And your microbiome can influence many aspects of your health, including your physical performance, your energy levels, your just mental health, immune system, weight management, and even how well you can sleep. The problem is that most people don't have access to the information necessary to manipulate your microbiome until now. Take Cole, for example. Cole is a collegiate athlete, and performing at his peak levels is really important not only for Cole, but his teammates and coaches as well. So if Cole were to be able to manipulate his microbiome in a way that would benefit his physical performance, then we'd be in good shape. BioMe is Cole's solution. With BioMe, Cole would receive a kit at home that would allow him to send us a stool sample that we would then run through our in-house pipeline so that we could design a personalized probiotic cocktail along with dietary recommendations that would manipulate Cole's microbiome in a way that would benefit or improve his physical performance. This whole process would take about three weeks. And we'll be earning revenues through individual self-out kits, uh, subscription self of, of our personalized uh, probiotic cocktails, as well as the identified data uh, to scientific entities. And even though we believe that BioMe can be used and beneficial to everyone, um, initially we'll be targeting the $100 million market that's spent annually on student <coughs> health and wellness. Today we're asking um, the Dalai Lab funds so that we could purchase this new technology that would allow us to sequence the microbiome samples in a cost-efficient, um, fast, high-throughput way that is well supported by the scientific community. We'd also be really excited to collaborate with Dali to develop pipelines for the cost analysis of the microbial um, sequence samples, and then also to develop a user-friendly dashboard for our customers to get access to their microbiome data. We at BioMe are uniquely qualified to lead this revolution in microbiome testing. Uh, we have two PhD in related field, me and Rebecca, an engineer, and a project design expert. So remember, with BioMe. The focus is you. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, BioMe. Judges, what are your thoughts? Hi, yeah, I really like this idea. I thought it was very interesting. Um, one of the questions that came to my mind was, are you planning on selling the probiotics that you're recommending? Why haven't you considered like, partnering with existing probiotics and going from there? So initially, we would be resourcing um, our probiotics from existing companies, but when we were looking at what actual microbes are available, um, we just think that there aren't as many out there that we could be using um, to, to make our probiotic cocktails. So yeah, initially we will be like working with other companies, but eventually we'd like to be making our own probiotics. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, one of the audience questions was, regarding 23andMe, and what stops com existing companies like them from uh, doing DNA testing and sampling from stool samples as well? Yeah, so there are, um, there are competitors that are, that are providing similar services to us, but what we found is that a lot of them are only looking at the bacteria in your gut. So I said initially that your microbiome is made up of, of microbes, so that includes bacteria, fungi, um, and viruses. And most of these companies are only looking at bacteria, um, and they're also not placing an emphasis on how the microbes in your gut are gonna be interacting with anything that you try to introduce through these probiotics. And that's how we differentiate ourselves. We'll be looking at the entire community of microbes in your gut, but also looking at how competition is going to influence like, how effective the probiotics are. Cool, thank you so much. All right, our next pitch is the artist formerly known as Eco Dining. They are homebound food, so put your hands together. Can people hear me all right? Um, I'm Connor. My idea is called Homebound Food. I'll uh, begin. The climate is changing incredibly rapidly, and it's very difficult as, as an individual to grasp how you are going to have an influence in the climate's future and influence it positively. An underestimated part of climate change is found in food production, waste, and transportation. 
In fact, one quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions come from the food industry. But what can you or I do about this? As an individual, I don't grow my food, and you likely don't either. And it's very difficult to walk into a grocery store and know which food had to be transported thousands of miles by plane, and which food was grown a few towns over and fertilized with compost rather than chemicals. Here's where homebound food comes in. Every grocery store in the country knows exactly where each piece of food in its store came from. And every type of food has an associated sustainability score that takes into account the amount of water and energy needed to produce it, as well as the impact that it has on the soil and surrounding ecology. Well, what if when you walked out of work at 5 p.m. on a Tuesday, you could open up Homebound Food on your phone, an app, and it would tell you in a beautiful display what grocery stores in your area you should go to, and once you're there, what products in those stores have the highest ranking sustainability score. And as the project grows, it wouldn't just tell you what individual foods to buy, but it could also say, here's an easy recipe to make with those very sustainable foods. And so when you get out of work, you could open up your phone, and in 30 seconds, you would know what grocery stores to go to, what products to buy once you're there, how to mix them all together in a beautiful recipe, and you would have the clear conscience of knowing that you're not just a consumer, but you're part of a growing demographic of people who know that they're economic choices have a huge influence over our climate's future. Um, my hope is that through Dolly Lab and the Magnuson Center, I can get funding and technical help. Um, my background is not in the computer science world, um, so I would need help in designing this app. Um, and hopefully I could get funding to continue my work in sustainability <coughs> and outreach to stores. Thank you. Do you have a plan for how you will sort of begin launching this? Do you want to start in a specific area, or do you have um, certain grocery stores that are willing to be transparent and are confident that they know where their food is coming from? Yeah, great question. Um, my thought was to start by producing this app and then going to stores like you could start with the co-op and say, hey, we're not going to charge you anything, but we're going to give you this app and so that users in the Hanover or extended Hanover area can download the app and then say, oh, this great grocery store near me has all these sustainable products, I can go and buy them, and that's gonna incentivize the co-op to use the app because it's bringing consumers in. And once you've demonstrated that, you could go to Boston and say to the market basket, hey, look, we've used this in other areas and it's working really well for those grocery stores. Do you wanna now pay us to have that same service? Very interesting. Um, something some of our audience members are asking about is how you'll factor in price and other, other considerations that shoppers might have or grocery stores might not be able to account for as much. Yeah, also a great question. Um, I think that would function like anything when you go onto the internet and look at Yelp and say, here are the stores that I'm interested in. It has a price tag associated with that and you can take that into an account. Um, but what's interesting about the idea is that people would still have the option to choose whatever economic path that they wanted, but this is a way of offering them information. Rather than having them go into a store and shop blindly, they could say, at least now I'm going in with the information, and if I'm going to buy these apples that had to fly here, or these apples that were grown one state over, and they're the same price, at least I know which ones I should buy. Great. Thank you so much, Connor. And that was Homebound Food. Our next pitch is very dope. It is the cult of dope automations. So, yay! Hi, my name is Sarah Kay, and here's why all of you should join the cult of dope automations. So I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with the chaos of the past two weeks. We've got tests, we've got cluttered desktops, and we've got recruiting season. But what if we could automate all of these problems away? Well, here's the thing. A bunch of people, including Apple, have already created tons of useful automation tools, but literally nobody knows about them. Here are a bunch of things that I've been able to automate. And just so you all know that I'm not making this up, I have a quick demo of um, one of these automations in action. So there's this tool called Hazel. And what Hazel can do is see your files and modify them. So here I'm downloading a file from Canvas, generically named PSET9. And what Hazel can do is see that file, move it to the right class folder, and rename it for me without me having to do anything um, not only have these products saved me tons of time, but they also don't require any complex code. All you have to do is just click a few things, 
and drag people and other things, and you're done. So that means anyone can make it, as in you, and you, and you, and you. Anyone who knows how to click something on their computer can build this. Um, and especially for startups, y'all are trying to get money so you can scale your business, right? So why not scale it with your own automations that you can build? As for the competition, if none of you have heard of these before, that's because right now, so far the tutorials for how to do these things have only been directed towards power geeks or that sort of thing. But again, you don't need to be a power geek. So what am I looking for? I'm looking for people like you and you and you who are interested in automating something in your life. And just think about it. I'm sure we all have something that we could have that we have to credibly click or do that we can have a computer do. Um, and I'm here to just spread the word, hopefully get some help from Dolly in building a more accessible platform for that kind of thing, and connect with other startups. As for the business model, at first I thought, hey, why not just make a simple kit of like a few automations for students to use? But that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build a community of students who want to get things done quicker, can solve their own problems, and encourage others to do the same. In the meantime, though, I've reached out to a bunch of creators of these. If anyone knows anyone at Apple, please hit me up. Um, and they've been agreed to help me work on some things and um, create workshops and be able to help spread this to everyone. So thank you, and I hope you all would like to join the cult today. Hi, I like your idea. It really resonates with me as an undergrad, too. I wish I had some of these things. Um, but it makes me wonder. Uh, I really like the demo that you showed, but sometimes for some of these tools and automations to work, you have to download a package of things and there's an entire installation process. Do you plan for all of the automations to be this accessible to people who don't understand technology? Yeah, I mean, um, so I'm actually working on a workshop right now with my professor, and part of it is just trying to make sure that these tools are easy to download. Um, and like, it's really just you go to their website, you download it, and you just click something. Um, but I'm even thinking of, make, of just kind of leading a class through that on just how to like um, open those things for other people. So. Um, hopefully that part would be streamlined. Great. Um, so for audience questions were regarding your business model and like the financial model mm -hmm. and what your thoughts are on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess as far as business model goes, again, like my goal isn't really to make money. It's to change the mindset that you we can automate things in our everyday life. It doesn't have to be exclusive to like big corporations doing it and scaling your business. Um, so I'm not really looking to make money. I'm looking to just change our culture and our mindset. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> I wish the clicking would be automated. Okay, so next we have eTouch, which can really revolutionize accessibility with tech. So give a round of applause. Hello, my name is Tanya. I'm a 22 from Ukraine, and I am hopelessly passionate about engineering. My project is eTouch, or Affordable Braille for the Blind People. So 285 million people are visually impaired, and an astonishing 88% of blind people are illiterate. This is called Braille Disaster. It is caused by unaffordable technology for reading and inaccessible Braille literature. And this is where eTouch comes in. Our solution is twofold. First, we design what is essentially a low-cost Braille candle for the blind. The ones currently available in the market cost from two to five thousand dollars, and that is 17 monthly Ukrainian wages. What we design in a dorm room with like burning capacitors is a prototype that costs under three hundred dollars. Um, we use instead of expensive piezoelectrics, we use magnetic relays and micro stepper motors. And now, second part is how to bring literature to those uh, blind people. We integrate Project Gutenberg into a cloud-based library that has all over 60,000 literature pieces translated into Braille. We also have voice recognition and language parsing for blind people to be able to access it very easily. Uh, this is our prototype. Users would open the app, it connects to the Wi-Fi, then they can parse the text that this is more for prototyping or access the books from the library. <laughs> and then our device will start working. Those pins are touchable, they refresh, and users can read the, the text. Um, this project was inspired by our blind friend who told us about those challenges of blind people, and we worked for two years. We won Intel ISAF, International Competition for Engineers, and right now, we really want to make an impact. We're pitching for money and team and uh, support to launch. 
Our mission is to bring literacy, confidence, and equality to the huge part of our society. So let's redefine Braille. Awesome pitch. Um, I think you pointed out such an important flaw in something that is supposed to be accessible, but then the financial accessibility, there's like a huge <coughs> gap there. Um, one question I do have is some of the other models that you've shown like have like their own buttons, and it kind of seems that they have a developed interface. And this could be something maybe you're thinking about in the future, but as far as interacting with like the Google Store or like different Apple devices, obviously Apple and Google are working like on their own behalf to make their devices more accessible, and there are many ways in which they come up short, especially for the blind. Um, how do you plan on originally bridging that gap so that people can download your software since it is something that connects like with the phone and like a cell phone app? Uh, so blind people use technology accessibly. They have phones like we do. They know how to click the apps. They are absolutely on board with using their phones. Uh, the problem is that now to find literature, they would go on Reddit, scroll, I know, ask their friends to scroll through endless pages of different books, to find this like one file somewhere in the depths of Reddit, download it to the device, and by the time they are at the end of this process, they usually give up. So what we try to do is to make this entire struggle of finding literature and being able to afford those devices as simple, as accessible, as inexpensive as possible. So the gap that we want to uh, close is to bring this low, low um, cost accessible literature for the blind people. Um, and I guess another question would be, um, do you have any like ideas or aspirations in terms of the hardware that you'd like really like to see developed? Like, what are some beyond like what we see in the slideshow? Like, what are you, I guess like your biggest dreams for the touch? So what you saw was the first prototype we built in 2018. Our second prototype, when we were flying from the Intel ISOP competition back to home, they stopped us at the checkpoint. They saw it's like a terrorist bomb, and they made us throw it away. So unfortunately, no more prototypes. Uh, but we also have an idea for the third prototype using something as simple as called solenoids. And hopefully, this will reduce the price to as low as $200. So our big aspirations is to work with Sierra School of Engineering. I love engineering. I would like love to spend nights on this project uh, and try to build the third prototype uh, and see which one works the best and go to production. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, our next pitch might be really useful here in isolated Hanover. It is food surfing. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Atman from Thayer. I am Samir from Tuck. Have you ever been on a long vacation and after having food at restaurants every day for five to 10 days straight, you start craving for home cooked meals, but have no option than continuing eating at restaurants? Or are you a foodie who loves trying new cuisines, but there aren't many options available in a small town like Hanover or those fancy big restaurants in big cities are really expensive. If you connect with any of these situations, give me a raise of hands. Let's also think of people among us who love to cook food and are even good at it. Also, what they actually yearn for is some social recognition or some monetary valuation for this talent of theirs. Just like Airbnb, Uber, or other huge platforms which simply connect service providers to consumers, what if there could be a platform for meal services? This is where food surfing comes in. The idea is to build an app-based platform where foodies like you and me can connect to local cooks who can provide you with authentic home-cooked meals. And since chefs wouldn't have to invest a huge capital like restaurants, the prices would be extremely cheap. And thus, we all can have new cuisines at extremely less prices Chefs can get a new source of revenue, and all of this would be with sharing culture and new interactions. The, business, the market is huge, and our business model is to simply collect a charge, a commission, on every transaction. Since it's a platform, and we need both foodies and chefs to be there on the platform. Um, there won't be enough foodies without chefs, and there won't be enough chefs without foodies. 
and we need magnesium crime to solve this chicken and egg problem. Secondly, uh, we also need daily resources to help with our MVP. And finally, we as food serving are here as we're looking for all talented people like you to come on board with us. Yeah, basically what it means is we are hiring. <laughs> Hi, um, so what strategy do you guys plan on putting in place to maintain quality of the food while minimizing transaction costs? Yes, so um, this is a really good question. And what we plan to do is, like uh, Airbnb and uh, Uber have, initially they did not have this process of vetting who are coming on board as hosts or drivers. We would have this process at the start itself. And initially, this would be a more operation intensive uh, procedure, but initially every first meal would be kind of taken by a valid kind of recommended uh, customer. So they would give us feedback which is kind of more valuable than generic reviews. So that is how we would know that a particular cook is kind of authentic and the food quality is good. Okay. Um, in terms of a question from the audience, and uh, so, they are asking how would you deal with issues such as food poisoning and other local obstacles, which is kind of, I guess, a built on onto, onto the prior one. Um, so this is very similar to the question that you asked earlier, the first one. Uh, obviously, there would be vetting done, but the other thing that we're looking at is the reviews. Um, sometimes the reviews left by other previous uh, foodies can be extremely helpful uh, in deciding whether what kind of cuisine I want to try, or whether there was any issues in the previous hosting experience. Uh, just to kind of add on that, like the probability of anyone going to a good fancy restaurant and also having food poisoning would kind of be the same as on this platform because kind of the probabilities would overall be the same. Uh, but we would try and have like a, a monetary fund in place to kind of, because over here, we are considering the cooks to be our partners and not our employees. So in a way, it would not be, li we wouldn't be liable to kind of uh, give away any uh, reimbursements. But the way Airbnb has, we would also give kind of uh, if there are any clash of um, opinions, we could like solve that by giving some uh, reimbursements. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> Last but definitely not least, if you are a student at Dartmouth, this is something you want to pay attention to. This is Dart Drop. <laughs> Hi there, I'm John, and I'm the founder of Dart Drop. So, I'm sitting up at 4 a.m. and I'm refreshing the ORC website, waiting for that little number to change to see I can, if I can get into that physics class I missed out on. And I'm wondering, why is it like this? You know, for many students at Dartmouth, the idea of this system being so complex and having such anxiety compounds onto the stress we already face as students. So to combat this, we built the iOS application Dart Drop with two components, Class Alert and Course Docs. Now, Dart Drop works as the intelligent device in your pocket while working for you in the background without you even noticing. With Class Alert, you get an automatic update the second a class opens up. No more refreshing the ORC website, no more staying up till 4 a.m. We work quietly in the background and alert you the second it happens. But Class Alert is so much more than this. We use our artificial intelligence algorithms to categorize professors so you can choose the best professor for your class and see what are the popularity of classes at Dartmouth for a specific term. Course Docs helps you repurpose your old school notes while helping others at the same time. Earn cash without taking an academic, or sorry, taking a course, uh, without taking an additional job on top of your course load. Now adding notes is incredibly easy. Just put your phone above them and you're done. We scan them automatically for you. And we take all these notes and we package them up and give them all around to New Hampshire High School so a high schoolers can become more college prepared. So let's take a look at the numbers. We launched three weeks ago and we have over 200 students using our application. But we're scaling really fast at the moment and we need your help in order to get to the point where we want to be. So we're partnering with DPlanner in order to cover all bases of the college cycle. We're going to make college, the college experience more intelligent. So, it's time for the anxiety that students have faced to be extinguished. It's time for a new enterprise of 
of creative solutions and new designs to come forth. And it's time for Dartmouth to take the leap in innovating the college experience of America. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'll take any of your questions now. Uh, great pitch, John. Um, obviously, this is like the huge, I don't know, nightmare of like 19W sort of like ORC thing that definitely like resonated with like a little bit of flashback there. Um, I guess one question I think might have been answered by your original application, but in the vetting of these notes, like is there sort of like a confirmation process that these are good notes and someone had mentioned like potentially um, like sensitive information from exams being leaked? And I think you mentioned that professors might be the ones in charge of like this vetting system. Um, specifically with that solution though, I was wondering what incentives there are for professors or like perhaps other people to participate in that vetting process and when they really do that if they don't have the time to. Well, great question, Wiley. Well, this product expedites the process of students wanting to drop into a class and becoming more committed. If you drop into a class and you know the exact parameters of what you're getting yourself into, you're gonna be more committed from the get-go and you're not gonna drop the class. But it's all about having that prerequisite knowledge of where you're going forward. So the incentive is having a more secure and, and known class from day one, as opposed to one and a half weeks in, you know, three students dropping in, groups being broken. We make that process available from day one. Um, I guess another question that someone has is, well, why do you think that this solution, like specifically alerting people about when a class spot opens up, which could potentially create more competition, is a better solution than perhaps like working with the original system and changing that? Sure, we would, if they would support that. But what we are creating here is a system that allows people with the device in their pockets to get an instant alert the second a class opens up, which is a huge pain point for students already here. If they were open to working with us, we'd really love that. And the connections and being part with Dolly would ultimately secure that for us. So it'd be great. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. And also to all 12 pitches that just presented. Um, amazing job. Uh, we were all blown away. Right, judges? Yeah. OK. Um, so here is the deal. We are going to be counting up your ballots, which you should drop as you leave to get pizza. But don't not come back. So definitely come back in around 20 minutes when we're done deliberating, um, and we'll just announce the winners of all three prizes. So get some pizza, and see you soon. I hope you all gorged yourself on pizza. I know I'm not done after this. I'm returning and finishing off another two slices. Um, yeah, so again, everyone did an amazing job on their pitches, and like, yeah, I have no words other than great job. Uh, but now we're going to announce the official winners. So, the first prize is the audience prize. So this is who won the, gathered all the ballots and everything. So it's what you decided gave the newest and coolest and most feasible and impactful uh, and great presentation pitch of all. This is the best pitch award, and the prize goes to. Oops. Yeah, sorry. We can do that. Yeah, you the Goes to E-Touch. <laughs> so that we could talk about logistics and whatnot. But again, congrats, pitchers, and thank you everyone for attending. We hope to see you for the 20 winter pitch in February. Bye.